Good morning. <laughs> Lovely to see you all this morning. And welcome to our worship here at Castle Methodist Church, Colchester. We welcome all those who are joining us online, whether live or following the recording. We pray that God will bless us all as we are united in fellowship. If you're here visiting us this morning, we invite you to join us for refreshments and continuing fellowship at the close of the service. This morning, it's great to welcome our minister, Reverend Chris Priest, to lead us in our worship. So let us prepare ourselves with a moment of quiet, remembering we're here in the presence of our Lord. Good morning everyone. Is it wonderful to be with you? Um, I was told once that you should never start a service with a confession, but I'm starting with a confession this morning in the sense that technically speaking last Sunday was Aldersgate Sunday because it is the Sunday on, on or before the 24th of May, but that rightly was su superseded by Pentecost, so I've moved it. Um, and we're going to have our equivalent of Aldersgate Sunday today. But for those of you who think, ah, but it's Trinity Sunday, I'm not ignoring it completely. <laughs> it, it gets a mention, um, not least in our call to worship. So it's wonderful to be with you and to share with you this morning. And our call to worship is inspired by Psalm 8, and I invite you to join in with the words in red. Gathered in the name of Jesus Christ, inspired by the Holy Spirit, and blessed by God, we come to worship one holy God. O oh God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. Your majesty is the music of the starry skies, yet even children of dust can sing your praises. In the name of the healer, the provider and the enabler, let your gratitude and joy be made known. O oh God, our own God, how wonderful is your name in all the earth. All of our hymns this morning have links in some form or another to Methodism, and our first, Born in Song, is written by a Methodist minister. So born in song, God's people have always been singing. And of course, we always say Methodism was born in song. We stand as we're able to sing number 21. <laughs>
So let's come before God and pray. Let us pray together. Holy and life-giving God, you are the Father and Creator, Son and Redeemer, Spirit and Advocate. We are in awe of your glory and majesty as we look around the world which you created. You created all that we see and we praise you for the natural world, humanity and the imagination you have given to all. We praise you for Jesus Christ, your Son, who redeemed the world. We live in freedom because he died and rose again for all people. We give thanks that Jesus shared our humanity, lived in the world, sharing our joys and sorrows, knowing that his presence is always with us. We praise you for your spirit, who moves in this world today, leading and guiding, challenging and comforting, revealing your will for the world. We know there are times where we've not followed your will in our lives and we ask for your forgiveness. We know that we haven't always acted in ways that you'd expect of us or trusted you as we should. And we ask for your forgiveness. We bring our own prayers before you now in a time of silence. We offer you our open hearts, minds and souls as we seek you once again. So thankful that you offer your forgiveness to all who truly confess to you. One in three and three in one, we praise you, our Lord, creator, redeemer and sustainer, today and every day, as we pray in and through the name of Christ. Amen. Now I'm going to invite the younger people to come to the front, not least because there is one slide which it is an awful lot easier to read from the front. So if all of a sudden you get a few friends of people wanting to join you, feel free. Now my biggest challenge at this moment is not to give you the answers too early. But there are going to be some quotes coming up. We have here a picture of John Wesley, because we thought if we, if we were going to do Aldersgate Sunday, it might be as well to mention John Wesley, just maybe, slightly. Um, so we're going to do that. And there are, he came up with various quotes. He wrote a journal. Someone's just given me a copy of John Wesley's journal. Um, all eight volumes and said, you'll need 14 inches of bookshelf space. That is true. I will be sorting out my bookshelves. But there are some various quotes that he came up with. And here is one. My heart is st was strangely warmed. Now, we're going to come back to these quotes in a minute. And I'm trying very hard not to give you the answers. And on this slide, it says here, and this is to do with that quote of John Wesley's heart being strangely warmed. And it says on this, this long bit here, about Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans, about a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. And this is John Wesley writing, I felt my heart strangely warmed. So that gives us some idea of that quote. So let's move on to the next one. Now there's a picture here of a very significant part of John Wesley's life and if I say any more I'm going to give you the answer so I'm going to be very good and say no more and then we get this quote a brand plucked from the burning which is a quote from Zechariah but a brand plucked from the burning the next one is the best of all is God is with us which again is something that John Wesley said and the last one, the world is my parish, which as an Anglican priest 
he was used to perhaps having a small area and then he said actually no the world is my parish so what order in john wesley's life did these all come in so which one do we think came first any ideas if it's a guess it's fine any ideas Number four, first, the world is my parish. Okay. Any other takers, any other bids? Yes. Brand plucked from the burning. Yes, that's the first one. He was six. Um, the fact that the fire happened on my birthday, let's not even go there. I wasn't around in 1709. Um, so a brand plucked from the burning. And that very significant house was the rectory at Epworth where... In, in Lincolnshire, where John Wesley was at the time. And in 1709, of course, the main way to um, heat your home was to have a fire. And sometimes fires went too far. There were other fires that happened in his life, but let's not go there. So what do we think the next one may? We might need to go back, Bob. Yeah. So we've got a brand pluck from the burning. Which one comes next? in John Wesley's life. The next two are, are only a year apart, so it's a bit mean in one sense. Yes. The first one, my heart was strangely warmed. Well done. And that was on the 24th of May, 1738. And that's the bit where we get the Wesley Day from. So at Wesley's Chapel in London on Friday, 24th of May, they had six services, all celebrating. So, okay, so we've got to that one. What's the next one? Third one, no, which only leaves us one more. The world is my parish, which he wrote in, about in his journal on, uh, no, in a letter, sorry, on a letter on June the 11th, 1739. And now we get to the last one, which is a bit of a giveaway now. The best of all is God is with us which he said aged 88 on his deathbed. They are thought to be the final words of John Wesley. The first one of those, a brand plucked from the burning, comes from his mother, Susanna. And she was quoting Zechariah um, ver th chapter 3, verse 2, when she said that. John Wesley was, or Jackie as he was known to his family, was in a top window and his life was saved as he jumped out of the window, first floor window of the rectory when he was six. He was caught, he was alive, as we've seen, from all that happened. And his mum said that he was a brand plucked from the burning because he was saved for a special purpose by God. I think we'd probably agree with that, wouldn't we? It would be fairly hard as Methodists not to. And Susanna Wesley was someone who I think was a theologian of her age and spent a lot of time with her children, helping them to grow in their relationship with God. She met with every child every week to talk to them about their relationship with God and their discipleship. In meeting with them individually, she helped them to develop in their faith and she also gave them confidence in sharing their faith. And the theme for our service today is all about having confidence in the gospel. And I think that perhaps that her approach pretty much worked for her family. We need to be brave sometimes. We need to be encouraged. We need people to walk alongside us, to help us to grow in our faith in Jesus so that we can go and share the wonders of the gospel to the world. As John Wesley said, the world was his parish. And perhaps we think today we work more in our communities, but beyond as well. So as we think about having confidence, let's come before God in prayer. Let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you that there are those who go before us who have the confidence to share your name, your gospel, your good news. And we pray for each person here 
that you will come alongside and bring the right people. And we pray for those in the youngsters amongst us who during this service will have that opportunity of people walking alongside them to help them to come to know you better. And so, Lord, we offer these our prayers as you build our confidence in you. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you all. Our next hymn is one that was written for the 250th anniversary of um, John Wesley. And you will find that there are various things within it that perhaps just link to some of the quotes we've just come across. How small a spark perhaps gives you a little bit of a giveaway. I think the heart strangely warmed also gets a mention. Born in song is there as well. And so we stand and we sing together how small a spark has lit a living fire. So we hear our two readings for today. Thank you. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Peace and joy. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, 
because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. You see, at just the right time, when we were so powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much, how much more shall we have saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we save through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Thanks be to God. The second reading is taken from Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 to 11. Jesus sends out the 72. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go. I am sending you out like lambs amongst wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you. For the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, The kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Thanks be to God for his word. Thank you both. Before we reflect on those readings, we will sing together. Um, this is, I, I realise, our first Charles Wesley hymn of today, but we, are, we have some others as well later. But let's sing together. Come Holy Ghost, our hearts inspire. Let us thine influence prove. Source of the old prophetic fire, fountain of life and love. Thank you. 
So let us pray together. Loving and gracious Lord, through these words that are spoken now, may we hear your voice and speak to us all in our need. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. There are many reasons why we celebrate anniversaries. Often it can be a birthday. I was talking to someone not very long ago who was a little alarmed at the landmark birthday of her daughter and how old it made her feel. But at other times, it can be to mark the beginning of a particular chapter in life, such as a wedding or a new job. These are, of course, all important and should be marked. Whilst in Methodism, we don't celebrate saints' days, perhaps in the way some other denominations do, Wesley Day is celebrated on the 24th of May, or, and that's probably the closest we tend to get. But this doesn't mark the beginning of a life as such, a wedding or a job, but a spiritual experience. John and Charles Wesley were brothers who had a significant spiritual experience three days apart from each other. Charles's experience of the Holy Spirit left him at peace and rejoicing with Christ on the 21st of May. And on the 24th, John had his famous experience I read a little bit earlier, but I'll read the full entry now from his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. It's no accident that John and Charles both had a spiritual experience and an encounter with God within days of each other. They both had a newfound confidence in God, in their discipleship, and this then showed in the actions and the way in which they lived. When I was thinking about this very famous quotation in relation to this service, I realised I'd not read Luther's preface to the Romans for myself, and that maybe I should. Fortunately, I managed to find an English translation, otherwise it would have been an idea that would not have worked. But I was genuinely wondering what was said that might have warmed Wesley's heart so much. Of course, we'll never know precisely. But I did find when I was reading it some really good quotations. One that Luther wrote is that faith is a work of God in us, which changes us and brings us to birth anew from God. It is all about the change in us which God brings about through faith. Our passage from Romans does this. It reminds us that when we come before God in faith and are open to the work of Christ through the Holy Spirit, that peace and hope will fill our souls in a new way. This will bring us a new sense of confidence which exudes from us and which others cannot fail but to notice. It's a confidence which comes from the grace of God. The Romans passage begins with the word, therefore. This is not an unusual word in Paul's writings, but reminds us that it immediately links to what has gone before. This is to remind us that we've been set right with God, through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and that the grace of God has gone before us and prepared the way for the peace and hope that is to come. The confidence which comes from our faith should not be overconfidence, but a genuine yet humble confidence in Christ, which comes through the knowledge of God through the Holy Spirit, in the light of the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
The transformation of our lives through the faith we have in Christ is the work of God. It is, to take Luther's idea, the change which God does in us and which then shines out from us to others. There's no doubt that the spiritual experience the Wesleys had was a positive one and also led to many other positive experiences. Yet not all of their journey was paved with gold, so to speak. The trip to Georgia about three years prior to this experience was for John a very unhappy time. He'd gone as an ordained Church of England priest in a missionary role, but things had not worked out. He found himself in a pastoral role to which he was not suited. He also fell in love with a young woman who gave up waiting for his expected proposal and married somebody else, which caused more problems and arguments and also a number of grievances being brought against him. Our reading shows the importance of our faith in times of adversity. It tells us that this will help to produce perseverance, which leads to character and finally hope. When we can find the sense of hope in difficult times, we can become stronger and more confident in our faith. There are times where we are knocked, where circumstances and people cause us to question ourselves and God. And it's right sometimes to acknowledge this and to be open about it and to it. If we can come before God and allow him to work through the Holy Spirit, we can, sometimes eventually, but we can find a sense of peace and hope in God, which gives us the strength to face the struggles of the moment. Whether this was in Wesley's mind when he heard the reading of Luther's preface, we don't know. However, the preface includes the following, which shows us the importance of a strong faith and how God supports us in and through this. Luther writes, Faith is a living, unshakable confidence in God's grace. It is so certain that someone would die a thousand times for it. This kind of trust in and knowledge of God's grace makes a person joyful, confident and happy with regard to God and all creatures. This is what the Holy Spirit does by faith. In leading those who became known as the people called Methodists, Wesley showed a huge amount of faith and well-placed confidence in God. He demonstrated his faith through his prayer life, which was well documented, and his trust in Jesus as he led people through a significant time of change. He was willing to embrace field preaching, although it wasn't something he naturally took to, but could see the advantage of in that context. Wesley was a confident disciple who trusted in the Holy Spirit to lead him to new realities. Wesley also encouraged others to become confident in their discipleship. He set up small groups called classes in which people could learn more about their faith under the wisdom and guidance of others. Many people came to know the power of God in their lives and a personal understanding of God's grace through the class system and the preaching services. In seeing the wisdom of lay preachers, and the role of lay people. He empowered, empowered others to be both more confident in their own discipleship and to help others to develop theirs. We know that God encounters people where they are in life. The end of our reading promises so much more through Christ. There were many people in Wesley's time who did not know the love and grace of Christ and who needed to hear the message for themselves. Often these were people who were struggling with a lack of education, medical care, or who had been imprisoned. 
The social justice work of the early Methodists sought to share the message of God's grace with others through their actions. They showed compassion and care to those with whom they worked through their service and their challenging of injustice. They could then come and rejoice in God as they saw that through Christ they could be reconciled to God and a new sense of freedom established. This brought a deep and lasting sense of confidence for all as the grace of God was shared and received. We think of the early days of Methodism and it's often on days of celebration we can forget the more difficult times. During the 19th century there were many different expressions of Methodism and in 1932 all was brought together with the deed of union. The church today is in numerical decline as many other denominations are and we could spend much time wondering what we're doing and why. However, I believe that God has so much more that he is calling his church to and this church to. We know that we are called first and foremost to be Christ's disciples. Let's take confidence from this. Let's take confidence in it. We have the joy and the privilege of placing our faith in God who will never let us down, whose grace goes before us and through whom we have been reconciled as the children of God. Christ has assured us of his presence from now until the end of time and the Holy Spirit is constantly working in their lives and the lives of the people and the world so that others may come to know God for themselves. On this Trinity Sunday, we celebrate the complete relationship there is between Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The fruit of that relationship is to invite all people to come to know God for themselves and to grow. We should take total confidence from this, both as disciples and as the ones sent out to share in God's work. In the Gospel passage from Luke, those who are appointed with a specific role are sent out to proclaim that the kingdom of God is near. To do this, those who are sent must demonstrate an appropriate confidence in the, in the role they are being asked to fulfil, but also sufficient humility to recognise that it is in Christ they must trust. They were asked to receive hospitality from others and to be considerate of others. Being confident in our discipleship is to receive as well as to give. It is to know the difference and to respond to the promptings of the Holy Spirit along the way. There are many today who think that we need to have more confidence in the Gospel. It is, after all, the good news of Christ that needs to be heard and shared with all. Last week we celebrated Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit empowered so many to go and share the message of the Gospel with others. In the 18th century, the beginnings of Methodism did the same, and great things happened. Today, there are many examples of growth, both spiritually and in places numerically, but we know that there are many who still haven't heard the Gospel for themselves. How can people respond if they've not yet heard the message? How can we take our Methodist heritage and reframe it for today in a way which holds to the values we have and the way in which God has called us as a church? The way in which we share the gospel will be as varied as there are people here. The ways in which churches draw together will differ church by church. Yet we know that it can be done. 
After all, it's been done before. Today, we need to ensure that we place a deep importance on our relationship with God through Christ. The Holy Spirit will nudge us in the direction into which we need to go so that we can be more confident disciples. We need to trust in Christ, who through his death and resurrection brought new life to the world through his victory over death. As we do this, both as individuals and as churches, we will grow spiritually and in our confidence in sharing the gospel. Our confidence must come through the empowering of the Holy Spirit, who will guide and lead us in God's ways. So let's have confidence in Christ, so that others may grow in their confidence and come to know God for themselves. Amen. Our next hymn is Beyond These Walls of Worship, which is written by two serving Methodist ministers, and I'm just going to hop over to the piano. So please, as we're able to sing. So let's come and pray together. Loving and compassionate God, we know that you seek for all to become confident in sharing your gospel. 
We pray for all those who follow you, that they may know of your grace and compassion. Seek to care for your world and planet, as well as the people and places in which they live. We pray for all who work for peace and promote unity, that all may come to know of your message of reconciliation shown to us through Jesus Christ. Lead all by your Spirit to have a wider understanding of your world, your people, and your actions in the world. You redeemed the world through your Son, Jesus Christ. We remember the love you gave for us and we offer ourselves to you once again as those seeking to become more confident in sharing your gospel with others. We pray for those who are vulnerable and rejected in any way, for those who suffer at the hands of others emotionally or physically. We pray that through your Spirit's leading, wisdom and compassion may be seen by those in need. Through your Holy Spirit, you equip others through the gifts, skills and talents that are given by you. We give you thanks for those who are artists, engineers, craftspeople and all who share their creativity in whatever way with others. Through your Spirit, may we all find new ways of being more confident in sharing the good news of Christ with others through the gifts and talents we have. We pray for those who are facing situations of injustice and pain. Your Gospel is for all and to enable all to come to you to find peace and wholeness. We bring before you in a time of quiet all those people who are on our hearts today for whatever reason. May all find their place in your world, O Creator. Find reconciliation through your Son's transforming love and be led by your Spirit to be complete in you. We offer you these, our prayers, in the name of Christ. Amen. We sing together of God's transforming love as we sing Love Divine or Love's Excelling.
And so we receive our offering for today. Let's pray together. Loving and gracious God, you have given so much to us. And so we bring these, our offerings to you. May they be used to further your kingdom so that others may come to know of the transforming love that comes only from you. We pray that they may be used as an expression of grace to go before, to challenge injustice, to seek to show your care and compassion. So take these, Lord, our gifts, our skills and our talents, that all may be used in your service. And we share together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And we sing our final hymn, And Can It Be?
so may the blessing of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you, those you love, and those you are called to love, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>